In reviewing the seven categories of possibly causeless things, we encountered three modes of existence. Loosely speaking they are Mathematical existence Material existence and Mental existence Mathematical existence includes abstract entities, logic, truth, numbers, math, properties, forms, equations, relations, possibility, structures, laws, and principles. This mode might include religious concepts of divine law, will or order, Tao or logos, the infinite indivisible truth, Asha or Govinda, and divine mathematics. Material existence includes matter, energy, the vacuum, space-time, physical law, the universe, the multiverse particles forces, fields, and physical systems. This mode might include what religions refer to as creation, cosmos, the material plane, and maya or illusion. Mental existence includes mind, consciousness, observations, perceptions, ideas, and dreams. This mode might include religious concepts of the mind of God, world soul, Atman, and souls or spirits. What is the relation between the three modes of existence, math, matter, and mind? Quote, My viewpoint allows for three different kinds of reality, the physical, the mental and the platonic mathematical, with something, as yet, profoundly mysterious in the relations between the three. Roger Penrose in The Big Questions, What is Reality? 2006 Math, Matter, Mind Of the three modes of existence, does any stand out as being more fundamental than any of the others? What is their relation? If one of these modes of existence can be shown as primary, while the others are derivative, then we might close in on a causeless cause. A common view of physicists is that matter produces mind, and mind produces math. But even among physicists, this view isn't universal. Quote, the triangle suggests the circularity of the widespread view that math arises from the mind, the mind arises out of matter, and that matter can be explained in terms of math. Non-physicists should be wary of any claim that modern physics leads us to any particular resolution of this circularity, since even the sample of three theoretical physicists writing this paper hold three divergent views. End quote. P. Tutt, Mark Alford, and Max Tegmark in On Math, Matter, and Mind, 2006. What is the reality of these modes of existence? Are all on equal footing? Or is one more fundamental while the others are derivative? Materialism, matter is primary. Materialism is the view that matter is fundamental. It assumes mental states are the byproduct of particular material arrangements, for example brains, and that mathematical objects, if they exist at all outside of minds, have no bearing on the material world. Materialism is a popular, if not conventional, view among physicists. Materialism can explain why our perceptions follow the patterns of physical law, but it has difficulty explaining why matter gives rise to mental states, this is the so-called hard problem of consciousness. Materialism also hits an explanatory dead end trying to answer why matter exists and why it follows simple physical laws. Quote, if eager to know the world's structure, ask the scientists. Science, however, seems unable to answer some key questions concerning the structure. For start, why is the structure an orderly one? Why do events so often develop in fairly simple and familiar ways, leading us to talk of causal laws? Then there is what can seem the biggest question of all. Science investigates the world's structure, but why is there anything at all to be structured? Why is there a cosmos, not a blank? Why is there something rather than nothing? Science cannot answer this. John Leslie in A Cosmos Existing Through Ethical Necessity, 2009 
Idealism, mind is primary. Idealism is the view that mind is fundamental. It assumes mental states are the basis of reality, and that the matter that seems to exist, exists only as thoughts and perceptions in minds. Idealism is expressed by Eastern religions, theologians, and mystics. But increasingly, physicists recognize they can't so easily do away with the observer. It seems the observer plays a necessary, if not fundamental, role in any description of reality. Quote, Consciousness cannot be accounted for in physical terms. For consciousness is absolutely fundamental. It cannot be accounted for in terms of anything else. End quote. Owen Schrödinger in Interview, 1931 But idealism doesn't answer everything. It doesn't explain why minds are bound up with the patterns of matter in a material world. Quote, we find that our perceptions obey some laws, which can be most conveniently formulated if we assume that there is some underlying reality beyond our perceptions. This model of a material world obeying laws of physics is so successful that soon we forget about our starting point and say that matter is the only reality, and perceptions are nothing but a useful tool for the description of matter. This assumption is almost as natural, and maybe as false, as our previous assumption that space is only a mathematical tool for the description of matter. We are substituting reality of our feelings by the successfully working theory of an independently existing material world. And the theory is so successful that we almost never think about its possible limitations. End quote. Andre Linden Inflation, Quantum Cosmology, and the Anthropic Principle, 2002. Platonism, math is primary. Platonism is the idea that math is fundamental. It assumes abstract objects are the most real, and that everything we see and perceive is somehow derivative from this higher existence. Platonism is popular among philosophers and mathematicians, whose job is to study the objective properties of abstract things. If mathematical objects form the basis of reality, it might explain why the material world is so mathematical in its form. Quote. In a famous 1959 lecture, physicist Eugene P. Wigner argued that the enormous usefulness of mathematics in the natural sciences is something bordering on the mysterious. Conversely, mathematical structures have an eerily real feel to them. They satisfy a central criterion of objective existence, they are the same no matter who studies them. A theorem is true regardless of whether it is proved by a human, a computer or an intelligent dolphin. Contemplative alien civilizations would find the same mathematical structures as we have. Accordingly mathematicians commonly say that they discover mathematical structures rather than create them. Max Tegmark in Parallel Universes, 2003 where Platonism falls short is in explaining how abstract objects lead to material or mental existence. According to Leibniz, the difficulty is explaining, how from eternal or essential metaphysical truths there arise temporal, contingent or physical truths. What came first? For each of the three modes of existence, there is an ancient school of thought holding that mode of existence as most fundamental. The mathematical, Plato believed, that abstract entities were the most real, and that the material world was derivative. The material, Plato's foremost, student Aristotle, disagreed, saying material substances were more real than abstract forms. The mental, several centuries later, Plotinus argued that mind was more real than the material reality it perceives. Today's scientists, mathematicians, and philosophers seem no closer to an answer on whether math, matter, or mind came first. Does mind give rise to math, or does math give rise to mind? Does matter give rise to mind, or does mind give rise to matter? Does math give rise to matter, or does matter give rise to math? 
To unravel the mystery of existence requires that we understand the relationship between these modes of existence. Only then do we have any hope of identifying an ultimate explanation, a causeless cause. Quote. To address the nature of reality we need to understand its connection to consciousness, and mathematics. End quote. Roger Penrose in The Big Questions, What is Reality? 2006. Are they one? Various thinkers have suspected the three modes of existence to be connected and perhaps are all aspects of one ultimate reality. Mind and matter as one. Modern physical experiments have revealed something inseparable between the mind and the observed physical reality. Quote. As we penetrate into matter, nature does not show us any isolated basic building blocks, but rather appears as a complicated web of relations between the various parts of the whole. These relations always include the observer in an essential way. The human observer constitutes the final link in the chain of observational processes, and the properties of any atomic object can only be understood in terms of interaction with the observer. This means that the classical ideal of an objective description of nature is no longer valid. The Cartesian partition between the I and the world, between the observer and the observed, cannot be made when dealing with atomic matter. In atomic physics, we can never speak about nature without, at the same time, speaking about ourselves. Tritjof Capra in the Tower of Physics, 1975. Quote, Aren't we mistaken in making this separation between the universe and life and mind? Shouldn't we seek ways to think of them as one? John Archibald Wheeler quoted in Trespassing on Einstein's Lawn, 2014. Math and matter as one. Likewise, mathematicians and scientists cannot help but notice a mysterious link connecting mathematics and the physical world. Quote. There exists, unless I am mistaken, an entire world consisting of the totality of mathematical truths, which is accessible to us only through our intelligence, just as there exists the world of physical realities. Each one is independent of us, both of them divinely created and appear different only because of the weakness of our mind. But, for a more powerful intelligence, they are one and the same thing, whose synthesis is partially revealed in that marvelous correspondence between abstract mathematics on the one hand and astronomy and all branches of physics on the other. End quote. Charles Hermite in Eloges Academiques et Piscu, translation page 323-1912. Quote. Maybe the relationships are all that exist. Maybe the world is made of math. At first that sounded nuts, but when I thought about it I had to wonder, what exactly is the other option? That the world is made of things. What the hell is a thing? It was one of those concepts that fold under the slightest interrogation. Look closely at any object and you find it's an amalgamation of particles. But look closely at the particles and you find that they are irreducible representations of the Poincaré symmetry group whatever that meant. The point is, particles, at bottom, look a lot like math. End quote. Amanda Gefter in Trespassing on Einstein's Lawn, 2014. All as one. If matter and mind are two aspects of one reality, and if math and matter are likewise two aspects of one reality, then all three must be connected, all would be reflections of one underlying reality. Quote. So how do the elements of the Trinity fit together, the phenomenological world, the physical world, and the mathematical world? On the unargued assumption that the principle underlying ultimate reality is radically simple, it will here be conjectured that these three realms are one and the same under different descriptions. David Pearson Why Does Anything Exist? 1995